Right. Hello, everyone. Everyone from the Brewmasters Collective who watches these videos. It's me, Matt Brunelson, here as MC once again. I got Eric Ponce with me, and we have two amazingly special guests, actually um, near and dear to my heart here in the California area from Los Angeles. We've got Bob Coons and Eric Bianchi from uh, Highland Park Brewery, the famed Highland Park Brewery of Los Angeles. And um, I'm not going too far to say, I'm just going to throw it out there, man. One of my favorite breweries, period. Um, I just have just so much love for this brewery and their beers. And, you know, kind of the way this whole story gets started is I got an email or a call or a text. I don't remember exactly what it was, but Bob uh, said, hey, man, you want to make a beer? And uh, pretty much uh, what was the answer going to be? Of course, yes. And uh, so that's that's where this story starts. But how are you guys doing this this fine morning? We're recording this thing pretty early in the day. Ready to drink some barrel-aged stout. Yeah, <laughs> breakfast of champions. That's right. Eric, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's good to be you know, here, guys. For, for those of you who've been following this whole thing, Eric's definitely a morning person. He's probably already been up for about four or five hours. He's probably racked like, you know, 10, 20 barrels already this morning. We're probably just screwing up his day because he's halfway done. He's probably thinking about lunch right now. This, this is my lunch time right now. Yeah, <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> Meanwhile, I, I rarely rise this early in the morning. So that's why I'm looking a little bit uh, tired. But anyway. Um, so, so the beer we're going to talk about, and it's, it's got quite a story, so we'll just dive right in, um, is part of the Lion's Den collection that you'll be receiving in these beautiful 500 mil wine-like heavy bottles, and that's a story in of itself. This is No Ends, Only Beginnings, our Highland Park collaboration beer, and um, gosh, where do you want to start, Bob? I mean, I think it really starts with you because you had this idea of making this monster stout with us so why don't you uh let us know a little bit what you were thinking yeah i mean i guess for me just as a beer enthusiast pretty much my entire adult life um i've been a fan of firestone walker beer and i think at some point like early like i don't know probably 2010 2011 when uh, Parabola was coming out and anniversary beers were coming out and I was saving every anniversary beer and drinking them vertically every year. Um, so I think prior to even knowing you as a person and becoming friends, you know, I, the beers were like, ah, um, to me. So once we started to form a friendship, I was like, I'm going to try to try to brew some stout with them. <laughs> uh so yeah pretty cool i mean i think the the original concept is you know we've, we've been a brewery for about eight and a half years and in that time we've made imperial stouts the, the entirety of it and we really have seen an evolution in our stouts and that you know stouts from say 2010 11 12 13 were uh well attenuated very little residual sugar um much more sort of uh, roast and char character in the beers and we have just uh, for us and our brewery they've taken this evolution where there's uh, I think in that state for me they just had a little too much edge to them it's like the higher alcohol the heavy char from the barrel the heavy heavy roast so we kind of are just constantly turning knobs on all of our beers to like tweak them and improve them and is what that's happened is there's this evolution that has taken place where they do, they end up, they're moving towards, they've had more residual sugar. Um, and a part of that is just to, for us to try to achieve balance with the, the edge of the char alcohol, you know, roast. Um, so um, the name is kind of a nod to that, this evolution. It's like only beginnings, no ends. Like everything we're making is kind of tweaking those knobs to like, try to get into the inner workings, improve the beer as we improve our palates and never expose to new things. So um, kind of cool. I think, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but like Firestone hasn't. Uh, have you all made a higher finishing gravity stout like this before? Not before this project. And it's what's interesting is, and the club is going to get kind of the, the fun evolution of this. This is the first time that we brewed a beer like this. 
Um, I would say that we, we took little baby steps in this direction on a couple of the previous Brewmasters Collective um, beers, but this is the first time we went all in. And subsequently, we've, we've collaborated with a couple other people. Side Project is one of them. Um, Weldworks just came out and they pushed us in that exact same direction. So we now have kind of a, a trio of beers coming out, um, each one very different, mind you, but all uh, with this very high kind of uh, starting gravity and higher ending gravity, which is so cool for me and, 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 and I think for Eric as well, because not only will it influence kind of the spectrum of beers that we're going to have in our arsenal and, and you know, now we have a whole different stout here that we're going to be tasting. Um, but when it comes time to anniversary, which you mentioned, um, there will be some of this beer, which should have a, a pretty profound impact on that blend if, if, if Eric releases some of this to the anniversary blend, that is, because you know the winemakers will use it. <laughs> so they're going to eat it up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what we found is the coolest thing is, you know, we, we now make barrel stock and part of this is Eric Bianchi or his sort of guidance in it, but with a variety of finishing gravities so that you have sort of more, more knobs to turn when you get those blends so that everything isn't like sitting in the same sort of like realm or spectrum. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because years ago, the winemakers were asking for something with a little more girth, and that's when we came out with Sticky Monkey. And as the name suggested, we were kind of making a bit of a sticky beer, but it still had a finishing gravity that would be considered quite well attenuated um, by these new, new age standards. And you know what? That's what's so cool about doing these collaborations with, with breweries like you guys. It, it tends to push us a little bit out of our comfort zone. I think the evolution of our barrel program was definitely continuing to move more in, in some ways, just because of, you know, as you, per, you, you perfect your brewing and, you know, you get better at these fermentations and you get better at producing good wort at these gravities, you tend to end up with better attenuated and leaner beers over time if you allow it to just kind of go uh, its natural path. And I think if you looked at Parabola over the years, even though we've raised the original gravity over time, uh, it's still a pretty well attenuated beer and could be described very much like what you were saying with your original stouts, you know, very roast malt forward, very well attenuated, uh, a lot of barrel um, influence because it is a leaner beer like that. So no, it's cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I'd say when we started kind of going more into this newer world of like 36 Plato starting gravity, like we didn't get as good attenuation as we're getting now. So just like being able to pay more attention to like yeast and that it's like, it's getting us somewhere where we're even happier with, with similar recipes again, like with what Bob said about tweaking knobs, but it's like, we can get the attenuation we want with it hitting this place where it's sweeter, bigger body, but still super drinkable. And, and when you look at these specs, we always put them on the label. So, you know, we hit 35 P uh, we finished up at 15 P. What do you think of those numbers? Yeah, that, we definitely, we always target like the 18 to 20 of like drop in there. And I think we ended up with 18. We went from like 34 to 16. Yeah, so, so there you go. Pretty darn close. So just since folks will be watching this thirsty, wondering when we're going to talk, actually drink the beer, let's go ahead and crack these guys. Um, anyway. and, and Eric, please don't, don't let me forget to talk about the actual packaging of this. We'll, we'll wait a little bit until after we've tasted it, but oh, believe me, I'm put, <laughs> putting this beer in a, Oh, nice. Look at that. Put, putting a beer in a 500 mil bottle um, has been a dream for a long time and, you know, heavily requested. Eric's always loved this bottle as well. Um, and, and remind me, Eric, now we, we dropped the carbonation slightly on these 500 mil bottles too, which we've seen is a little bit of a trend on these bigger beers as well, although it still pours with this just gorgeous kind of ruby off-brown foam. Oh, man. You know, so Bob and I have talked about this quite a bit. If we want to get a little bit into the geeky weeds on this is that you know, sometimes these big beers are prone to some acid aldehyde and we used a different yeast than we normally use for these beers. 
And uh, that's all you, Bob. So why don't you talk a little bit about using lager yeast with these giant beers? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're <laughs> out of sort of just efficiency, but I, I think it is to like navigate to uh, prioritize yeast health for us as a brewery. We're not a big brewery, um, but we make a lot of different styles of beer. So we, uh, we've we consolidated uh, and we use 3470, the Vine Siphoner Lager Yeast on a huge range of styles. So, you know, most of our West Coast IPAs are brewed with lager yeast as well as traditional lagers and Imperial Stouts. Um, and for us, it's more like uh, production based to prioritize yeast health um, and yeast management. And we stick on a, like a real uh, tight schedule and window. Um, and so uh, that is kind of our utilitarian approach to this. I mean, I think that the that yeast just gives us great simple platform for a lot of different styles. So, you know, um, styles that are not yeast driven, you know, if you can kind of get the noise out as much as possible, then the malt can shine or the barrel can shine or the hops can shine. Um, so that that is kind of where we've landed. And now, you know, most of our big stouts like this are, are brewed with 3470 uh, lager yeast. So. What, what, what's so funny about that is one, I think most people would never dream of making an imperial stout with a lager. At least it just wouldn't normally be thought of, right? You always think of ale yeast, and and quite honestly, I I, I don't know for sure, but in some ways, I almost feel like our lager yeast is a little more robust and maybe even alcohol tolerant than our ale strain. I mean, in this particular case, it performed as well as 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 our ale yeast probably would have and the reason why i mentioned the acid aldehyde thing is again lager yeast is in some people's mind more prone to acid aldehyde but in this case i feel like we got much less um and i'm not so sure we went through uh measuring it in the lab so i don't think i can i can tell you any numbers i, I can look it up later but um it really fermented clean and uh, the, the, the funny part about that is like when we get a stalled fermentation in this brewery, we usually hit it with lager yeast to, to finish the job. And in this case, we started with the lager yeast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is a, I like that trajectory. I'm always a proponent for, for lager yeast, so. Well, let's talk about what we're, we're smelling and tasting here. Um, you know, I, right away, I mean, and, and just knowing our house character with these big beers and the ale yeast, I get this completely different and, and almost cleaner, um, yeast expression in this beer. Um, Eric, how long was it in barrel? Around, uh, about 10 months. About 10 months. And yeah. And, um, and what were the barrels that you used? Well, kind of playing off the malt bill this malt bill is crazy insane. I love it. Um, I mean, the base malt is Marisada. Then we have nine other malts stacked on top of that with barley, um, spout, rye, oats, wheat. So I'm like, what Bob, we... Are, we, are, are we okay sharing some of the details of the recipe? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Love it. So uh, I, won't go, I won't go into the depth of like the percentages, but um, Eric already touched on a couple of these. But, you know, the base malts, we just went kind of right to the premium, right all out. It's Maris Otter and Golden Promise blended as the base malts, which are both just beautiful malts. Uh, they came from Simpson Malt House. Um, both of those are particular barley varieties that are typically used in high-end English ales and cask ales, but work so well in these stouts, just really rich and complex. They're typically kilned off at a little higher temper or temperature, excuse me, for a little bit longer. So they usually be a little bit higher color than your base Pilsner malts. We've got, Malted oats, dark crystal, chocolate rye, spelt uh, for good measure, uh, chocolate wheat, chocolate, uh, carafa. So there's some wire mint malt. There's some malt from uh, from Germany in this. Uh, roast barley, but not very much. It's it's certainly uh, the lowest percentage of anything in there. So what would differentiate this from a lot of our typical stouts is this really low use use of roast and the higher use of the crystals and chocolate malts. 
uh, and I don't recall using spelt in one of these beers. Uh, at least we don't typically use that. So yeah, it's just a rad malt bill. And I'll never forget, man, when we mashed in at your place, I'd never seen anything like it before. It was basically you, you made a dough or you made like, it looked like cookie dough in the mash mixer. Yeah. And every time yeah. the oh, agitator wow. turned, all you saw was this, I wish I had the video to play for everybody. You just saw this like, Bruh. it was like solid. There was like, there's no, there was no noticeable liquid in the cookie. <laughs> <laughs> and my first question was like, how's that going to run off, dude? And the thing ran <laughs> off like grease lightning. It was like magic. Yeah. And I, honestly, I don't even know how that works in that our, our Imperial Stouts on our brew setup, it, they're obviously our biggest beers we make. And they typically are not problematic at all. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, I would say this malt bill is somewhat unique for us as well. I think we just went all in on the chocolate malts. So, you know, you're saying rye and spelt and wheat, but those are all like chocolate wheat. Chocolate. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Chocolate. Yeah. And so it was like the, you know, the, I, I guess for you view, viewers out there, the chocolate malts tend to be more like round and sort of like, uh, I mean, think milk chocolate. And then as you get to like roast barley and carafa, they're like edgy, like dark chocolate with no sugar added into it. And so it was kind of this shooting for this like velvety texture from all these chocolate malts. And, and don't you think that that was accomplished here? I mean, this, again, in the context of Firestone beers is a really round and, you know, there is a lot of chocolatey character to it. I agree. It's velvety and smooth. And going back to the barrels used, kind of going back oh, off the, going off the, the kind of the recipe, what we're able to bring in were um, two phenomenal just, um, barrels from Buffalo Trace. One was their Waller, which is um, again made by Buffalo Trace. They use mash bill number three, which is slightly higher wheat in that mash bill. So a lot more like cereal grain notes, really sweet. And it was a 50-50 blend of the Weller barrels. Then we also got some of their single barrel Blanton barrels. And the Blantons is their mash bill number two. It's slightly higher. It's considered their higher rye mash bill. Again, higher rye with them. It's still about 12 to 15 percent. But you get you do get some slight um, spicy notes. So kind of playing off the mash bill, doing a 50-50 blend of a weeded bourbon and a rye-ish bourbon. Um, just kind of bouncing flavors off one another. And again, 10 months in barrel and just tasting through this and seeing the amount of grains that went in here, the slightly lower carbonation. I mean, this thing is so velvety and smooth and so well balanced. It's such an easy drinking sipper. And you do kind of get the flavors of, we were talking about Uberana wood, definitely get some baking spices and cinnamon and you get that vanilla so we are able to kind of accomplish the flavors that you can get from another exotic wood just off the mash bill and the spirit barrels used. So I love, man, I'm loving this beer. Such a well put together beer. Yeah. Yeah, that's something that, oh, go ahead, Eric. I, so I was gonna say just, yes, I get so much love of that like creme brulee, especially on the nose going in there. Uh, but it was funny what you mentioned about what barrels you guys ended up using because uh, Sam from Propagator came down when we blended but other than that we didn't really talk about what barrels you guys use and what we ended up blending is we're you know we're only like a three barrel blend but there's a weller and there's a woodford rye and a woodford double oak so it's like oh oh they well ended up with this same like <laughs> uh trajectory that's and great I, like i wish we could have gotten ours packaged to do side by side because off the last time we tasted those barrels like pre-packaging this is more very similar to what we were getting and it's like you know two completely different systems different barrels in different worlds it's you know it's always hard to like even get super close with the exact same recipe but as far as like collabs going in multiple places without being able to do a side by side this drinks very similar to me in a really cool way yeah so we did we did two brews on our brew house um you know they're never really high yielding. Um, and uh, 
and, and we hit this, this original gravity a little beyond what we normally do, which is so fun. And then everybody watches the fermentation so nervously because um, it always looks, you know, it just looks like it's in our world, like it's just not going to where it needs to go. And, but once they go in and out of the barrels, it's just like kind of this magical transformation takes place where it all comes together because off of stainless steel to me, it just tastes too sweet. And maybe that's the old school brewmaster in me. I'm just like, oh God, we're putting that in a barrel. Oh boy, here we go. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not involved in like our fresh beers at all, but when it comes to like stouts in the tanks, I'm always walking over and checking the log, like where did it ferment to today? Okay, we're still moving, we're still moving. Yeah, I mean, this took, I mean, I think we took our sweet time with it. You know, it, it took the better part of two weeks to kind of get to where we wanted to go before we felt okay about it. But, um, you know, looking at it, I mean, it, it just kind of marched along like lager yeast does, you know, it just kind of keeps going and going. So it's pretty cool. Hey, just so I don't forget, this really cool glass, everybody got one, right? It's, um, yeah. we're not doing a lot of, we, last year we did a glass with every single release and this year we're doing a, a little bit less of that, but I really dig this glass. I think it's pretty perfect for these kind of beers. Really allows the, um, the beer to open up in it. And, and certainly my beer came to me cold and as it warms up, I'm getting more and more of that baking spice that you're talking about, Eric. I'm also getting some really cool dry fruit character out of it. You know, um, I'm, I'm really glad we chose not to adjunct it. I think it, it just shows so well as it is. I don't, yeah, I don't think it needs adjunct at all. I, don't know. I also think it's a, interesting because it's, it, I mean, 10 months in barrel, but I feel like it is very spirit forward in the aroma, like the spices and like just kind of like pure bourbon decadence. But then because there, it is like a higher finishing gravity, that doesn't like lead to like edginess on the palate it, it goes from this like spirit forward front to this sort of like round velvety back end once you're drinking it which is a cool juxtaposition yeah i was, I was stoked when the barrels arrived on site we got them roughly five days after they were dumped in kentucky so just popping the bungs out and they you just see the the wood glistening inside a little puddle of uncut spirit in there and um, getting the beer directly on that as soon as possible. I mean, and, and like you say, 10 months in barrel and it just completely rounded it out. It's such a smooth, velvety, complex and balanced beer. And like you say, it doesn't really need, I mean, the adjuncts, I mean, you get tons of vanilla, you get chocolate, you get cinnamon, baking spices, all like in a completely balanced way. So this is a perfect, um, show showpiece of what a well executed recipe phenomenally uh, some really high quality barrels can do to to just create a, a beautiful finished non-adject beer yeah it makes me smile because i just i'm just so happy you guys kind of took us out of our comfort zone a little bit and pushed us to make something <laughs> like this because it, it's so much fun that's what you know that's what having this club actually has done for us we've it, we've done a lot of this just you know, not just collaborating, but kind of stretching a little bit and uh, kind of test testing what our kit can do and our uh, our patients in the cellar. And then Eric's getting to play with some pretty phenomenal barrels down there. So, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention the packaging end of this because. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if I already mentioned this. So promises made like a year ago. Michaela's so organized. You know, she wants to know what beers are going to be released next year. Who are you collaborating? But also what new package could we try? And of course, last year we tried some 750 milliliter bottles and <laughs> I've already talked about this, but maybe not with you, Bob and Eric, but uh, we literally went over to uh, Chuck Silva's place and borrowed um, a manual 750 counter pressure filler from him. And, and Eric literally filled every one of those bottles by hand and we're crowning by hand. And you know, I mean, as, as you would expect, you know, we had a few bottles that leaked as we shipped them to club members and we had some low fills and we had some high fills and oh, it was just <laughs> for a brewery who's used to working with like Crohn's and KHS fillers and automation. It was like, you know, a humbling reminder of what hand uh, packaging and hand artisanal beer making is all about. So then we promised these 500 mils, but I also at the same time promised Eric, I was like, I'm going to find an, a more automated solution to this. And 
we ended up calling our friend Max Montgomery down at There Does Not Exist and borrowing his two head Maheen filler, which he had only used for non-carbonated beer that he was bottle conditioning. Uh, and, and <laughs> it was and, just this. And we had about 30,000 bottles that were planned to pet to. Oh go. yeah, and then, yeah, meanwhile, the Michaela's like, ask in terms of total package was something that like on paper was going to take us 30 days to fulfill or some crazy thing on this machine so <laughs> it absolutely made no sense right but we did it anyway we brought the machine up we got it cleaned it passed pcr results we got it to fill after days of agonizing over how to make it like work and we got going and it was just going so slow and uh we happened to be doing a uh, collaboration uh with um uh, private press <laughs> and, and he's like hey you know there is a mobile bottler who can do this for you like in no time at all that's like cruising around <laughs> the central coast i'm like really <laughs> like doo -doo 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 -doo, call this guy up and so we kind of abandoned the mahin and ended up like packaging oh, out on the street in this like mobile rotary 500 mil packaging line um and it saved saved us a lot of time and grief but Long and the short of it, it was quite a journey to get all these bottles filled. And uh, but but the good news is you guys use this package, right? Um, yep, 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 yep. Uh, that all sounds very normal to us. The low fills, the high fills. <laughs> like, there's a different there's different packaging than that. I mean, it's it's so hard to watch when you're knowing like all those low fills or high fills or like you know beer that was painstakingly made that's so delicious that you don't yeah. want to waste. <laughs> So, is it the only bottle you're doing in this package well so the this entire release to club there were three separate beers packaged in 500 mils we did three different beers um anyway the, the idea was to kind of get it out there in the world and see how people respond and then if if it's something that people really love then we got to figure out how to do it like legitimately here uh next year sometime on our normal fillers we'll have to buy some change parts but yeah, yeah. Anyway. in the end it's a beautiful bottle perfect format it looks so good and um what was getting me through every day of filling this barrel the bottles was hopefully now we can just move full forward with the 500 mil and buy a machine <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Matt, don't be promising 375 packaging next year either, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I love the 500. I think it's the perfect size. It's a great looking bottle and like two eight ounce servings or 116. Um, I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I have a feeling people are going to really like it. So, you know, those of you in the club who are listening in, um, yeah, let us know what you think. Um, I don't know. What else do we need to cover, guys? I mean, I think we did a pretty good job. While we're yeah. talking packaging, I could show what our label. Oh, yeah. Like, which I wanted it to take. We wanted it to take some influence from like that. This classic color label you guys use and kind of the the arc there was kind of supposed to match with the volcano arc. And the lion and bear were the two dinosaurs on either side. Uh, did you find the original can from the non barrel Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So we had released this last year as a fresh beer. The uh, only beginning. So this was with Amber Wood and vanilla. So it was a fresh adjuncted imperial stout in can. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, just to, to recap, I mean, it was like... We did the collaboration. These guys, once they were finished in stainless, packaged some as an adjuncted beer and then laid the rest of it down to rest. Meanwhile, we came up here to Paso Robles, brewed the exact same recipe and laid it down in barrels for this particular release and almost coordinated uh, the barrel release with these guys. So you should keep your eyes open for, I don't know if any of those cans exist on planet earth anymore. Um, so I can't promise you you'll find that, but the bottle release is coming up and, and when and how would people get a hold of those bottles, guys? Um, it is the last Saturday of August, I think. Um, most of it gets pre-sold to our members, but there's usually a little chunk left that goes to public sale on that Saturday, last Saturday of the month. So we will definitely have some for sale. All right. Well, you, you heard it here. I'm making no promises to anybody, but uh, 
it's out there in the world. And man, we're just, it, it's just so amazing to do a collaboration with you guys. And I, I so respect what you do on the clean beer side, whether it's your light, delicate, beautiful lager beers or your well-executed West Coast IPAs or these stouts and everything in between. You just make so many good beers and have such a good sense uh, about it. Um, not to mention you're just great people and we love we love everything you do guys. So great thanks for letting us do this collab. I'm glad the beer turned out so well. I'm gonna take a couple bottles home this weekend and I think it's gonna be a good like, you know, backyard fireside beer to enjoy and relax with this weekend. And uh, yeah. yeah, just thanks cheers so much. Yeah, cheers, it was an honor. All right, cheers you guys, thanks so much. <laughs>